Hi friends. So in this particular video, we are going to be talking about MRI contrast media. So this is something which is a very, very important uh, topic for vivas. As I have said, iodinated contrast media as well. So either you can be asked to pick up iodinated contrast media or one of the gadolinium contrast agents. And this is where, you know, uh, you have a chance to really impress the examiners if you give some good answers that we are going to discuss now. So what we use in MRI contrast media most commonly are gadolinium chelate. Right, so gadolinium, as you know, is a three plus anion, and we use it with a lot of big, big compounds which are going to chelate it and prevent it from uh, depositing in the soft tissue of the body. So, this is what we use as MRI contrast media. Before I go there, a few simple concepts of magnetic susceptibility. So, we divide substances into diamagnetic, paramagnetic, super paramagnetic and ferromagnetic. So, any substance which has no unpaired electrons, right? So, any substance with no unpaired electrons is said to be diamagnetic and they will have no magnetic susceptibility. So, there is going to be no magnetic susceptibility which is going to be seen with them. Paramagnetic are very, very useful to us. So, paramagnetic have unpaired electrons. So, they will have magnetic susceptibility and what they tend to do is they shorten the T1 relaxation time. So, what they do is that they shorten the T1 relaxation time, meaning that they are going to appear hyper intense on a T1 weighted image. The biggest example here is gadolinium. So, gadolinium is a paramagnetic substance which is going to be T1 hyper intense. In addition, we have manganese that we used to use Mn2 plus, but this is something which has now been taken off the market. This has now been banned because it was observed that manganese in patients who have liver failure, it goes and it deposits in the brain and causes neurological dysfunction. Also, manganese has been linked to development of Parkinson's, right? So, this is an iatrogenic Parkinson's that it can cause. So, this is something why manganese is no longer used. But if asked, remember, it is a paramagnetic compound. Then we have super paramagnetic compound, which has a lot of unpaired electrons, okay? And this is what shortens the T2 relaxation time. So, it shortens the T2 relaxation time here. So, what you have to remember here that we do these on T2 weighted images. So, this is where we see them on the T2 as causing a signal drop, all right. So, we are going to see them as causing signal drop. This is what you have to remember for super paramagnetic and the example here is iron oxide. So, you are going to see the names like spio, super paramagnetic iron oxide, ultra small super paramagnetic iron oxide. So, this is dextrin coated iron oxide that we use as super paramagnetic compound and we use a T2 weighted image and more importantly we use a T2 star or a gradient image for seeing these super paramagnetic substances. When we talk about ferromagnetic, these are substances with a lot of unpaired electrons and they are going to cause susceptibility in all sequences. So, these are going to cause susceptibility without even the RF pulse, all right. So, these are going to cause a lot of susceptibility. So, this is how we classify the substances. So, what is very important for us for MR contrast purposes is gadolinium iron oxide. So, now let us go into the types of contrast. So, base of, based on the site on which they act. So, extracellular is just like any other contrast agents where they are going to behave just like the CT contrast where they will have phases. So, it will be in the arterial phase, then venous phase and then it goes into the interstitium, right? So, these are your extracellular contrast agents behave just like CT contrast, regular. All contrast agents unless mentioned otherwise are extracellular contrast agents. So, CT contrast as well as gadolinium. 
we have a special blood pool contrast agent which is called gadophosphazet which came under the name of ablavar and vasovist however this is not used very routinely now this stays within the blood pool it doesn't cross into the interstitium because it binds very tightly to albumin so this is the one image which is going to give you very good angiography images so this is going to give you the arterial and the venous phase for a very long time so this is something which will have a lot of potential for mr angiography images however it is not used very routinely as far as hepatocyte specific is concerned this is the most important that you need to know for the exam so these are contrast agents that are taken up by functional hepatocytes so if you have a tumor who which has functional hepatocytes which is mainly two so if you have an fnh or a well differentiated hcc it is going to pick up the hepatocyte specific contrast because these are the only two malignancies which have functional hepatocytes it's extremely important that if you see a hot spot or if you see uptake in a delayed phase of hepatocyte specific contrast agent that means it is one of these two dds two contrast agents here you need to know everything about them one is eovist which is gadoxytic acid has a very high biliary excretion and the phase comes in around 20 to 30 minutes whereas the more commonly used contrast agent which is gadobinate demiglobin you need to know the entire name memorize this multihans has little biliary excretion which is 5% and the delayed phase is taken somewhere close to 1 1 1/2 hours all right so these are your hepatocyte specific contrast agents and then we have our reticuloendothelial agents which are taken up by the kupfer cell so the spio uh, contrast agent which is super paramagnetic iron oxide is taken up by res the application here is that kupfer cells are present in fnh so this is what can be visualized all right so fnh will show the preferential uptake of spio here whereas other tumors will not show spio uptake on the other hand ultra small spio is when a particle is less than 50 nanometers and this is a compound that we use for lymph nodes so all you spio finds its use uh, wherein it's taken up by the normal lymph nodes whereas if it's a metastatic lymph node it will not pick up but if it's a inflammatory or a reactive lymph node it will pick up the you spio what you need to remember about both of these as we have discussed here we are going to be using a gradient t2 star image and it's going to be a reverse inverse contrast agent wherein the uptake is going to be seen as dark it's going to be seen as a hot spot all right so these are the trade names under which we get the reticulo endothelial agent so just to give you the examples here so we have spio here you can see in this image that there on the gradient echo there is uptake which is taken up by this lesion here which has a central scar which is t2 hyper intense almost iso intense here on the on the gradient images so this is what you need to remember is your fnh this is how fnh is going to show you uptake of spio the limitation is that it we cannot give a bolus it will be given as slow infusion so we cannot do dynamic imaging here and because it produces a dark spot when there is no uptake it produces a dark spot it can mimic vessels right so because of the loss because of the susceptibility right whenever it is taken up it is going to produce a loss of signal so this is why it can mimic vessels as far as u spio is concerned it will localize in the lymph nodes so we can distinguish metastatic versus a normal lymph node so look at this case here this is a breast carcinoma you can see the speculated margins and look at the two lymph nodes here one of these lymph nodes is the normal one and this is the one which is infiltrated when u spio is injected you can see that the normal one is completely taking up the contrast whereas the metastatic lymph node is not taking it up so it can be used to distinguish metastatic versus normal lymph nodes right so this is the extra edge recent advanced point that you need to know